pleasure to be with you. So, um, you know, I want to just cut to the, you know, cut right to it because we don't have much time. Um, I read manufacturing consent in undergrad and it inspired me to get into journalism and to, to start working for the, the student magazine at, at Tufts. And from there, I, I started thinking about different ways to start uh, my own independent journalism collective using the internet to combat, you know, the, the tool of the mass media as propaganda um, against the people. That fast forward, you know, that was back in 2005. Fast forward to today, um, we're getting ready to launch the Boycott Times, and it's a global collective of journalists and artists and um, thinkers from around the world um, with two of my mentors who I think you're familiar, you know, I know you're familiar with Cornell West um, is, is one mentor and then Sam Friedman um, at Columbia Journalism School who was of the New York Times are both working with me and, and others to, to launch this collective. And so, first of all, thank you for writing Manufacturing Consent. Uh, my question to you is, you know, why haven't there been global collectives of, of independent journalism trying to fight, you know, the wave? You know, there, there are the democracy nows, but can you talk a little bit about independent journalism? Can it exist? How can we, you know, be as successful as possible with this outfit? Well, there is independent journalism. Uh, things like... Uh, a couple minutes ago, I just got off an interview with Young Turk, for example, uh, the real news, you know, Paul Jay, uh, Democracy Now, of course, has been very successful. So there are efforts. It's, it's not easy. But for one, one problem is just funding. Who's going to fund it? You're not going to get corporate funding. You're not going to get, okay, or how about inter Intercept is another case. Mm -hmm. There, which to, happens to have a rich donor, but that's rare, you know. So that's one problem. Uh, the other problem is uh, just uh, uh, reaching out. It's, uh, you know, you can't ha have, you don't get advertising, you know, you know to get publicity. You've got to do it yourself, but it can be done. I mean, in fact, sometimes what happens is spectacular. Take, say, the Sanders campaign. Sanders broke with well over a century of American political history. It's not a small thing. Uh, you look at Tom Ferguson's work on buying elections, the kind of gold standard in the field. He points out from the late 19th century until the present, you can predict the outcome of an election for president or Congress with remarkable precision just looking at campaign spending, which means the corporate sector and the wealthy. Well, uh, Sanders totally broke with it. It's an astonishing achievement. Came very close to winning the nomination, could have under slightly different circumstances, even with all the media against him, no corporate funding. So, you know, you can have remarkable achievements. In fact, I think just what's happened to the country in the last 50 or 60 years shows what can be done. It's a very different country from what it was, say, in 1960, uh, 60 years ago. So just when people forget, you know, things that were taken for granted then would be unspeakable today. I mean, in 1960, the U.S. had uh, uh, anti-miscegenation laws so extreme that the Nazis refused to accept them. Of course, anti-sodomy laws lasted until this century. Uh, blacks, federal, federal laws required that blacks couldn't get into federally funded housing during the housing boom. It's one of the reasons Afro-Americans don't have wealth. That's when wealth was accumulated, roughly 20 years 50s and 60s of high economic growth. Blacks get jobs, but they couldn't buy, buy a home and live it down. That's the accumulation of wealth. Uh, it goes on and on. I mean, it's just a totally different country. 
So how do we take the, the momentum of the moment right now where we have a lot of people who are kind of maybe waking up to a lot of these realities that you've been talking about for your whole career and transfer that into actual systemic change? That's what's happening. Take say it doesn't happen by snapping your fingers, but it does happen. Take again the Sanders campaign. It switched the entire arena of discussion and debate well towards the kind of social democratic side. Uh, it's uh, led to election of you know, people like the Quad, for example, and so other new ones since. But all of this is totally new. Issues that are on the agenda now, it couldn't even been mentioned a couple of years ago. Take, say, a Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. That's essential for survival, literally some form or other, you can debate the details, but some form of Green New Deal is essential for survival, not in the far distance. A couple of years ago, it was an object of ridicule. It was mentioned at all. And by now, thanks to largely Sunrise Movement, other activists, Extinction, Extinction Rebellion, Global Strike, everything else, uh, it was, it's right in the midst of the legislative agenda. It still gets ridiculed and denounced and so on, but it's there and something's going to have to be done with it. In fact, even the Democratic Party campaign made a nod to it, say we have to have a Green New Deal. Could have imagined that a couple of years ago. So yes, these things are happening right in front of our eyes and they can be done much more. So how do you think that a new like global independent collective of journalists could best serve the people, you know, I'm, tr I'm thinking of it as a way, a platform for, you know, fresh perspectives and kind of um, Howard Zinn type perspectives of our histories and our present day moments. You know, how can we, how can I and, and we as a collective best serve um, these movements and allow them to get equal footing to major media outlets? Yeah you're not going to get the major, major media outlets. The way you affect the media, you, you're not going to change Tom Friedman, you know. Uh, you, the way you affect the media is by changing the background society within which they function. So the media happen to be a good deal more progressive than they were 40 years ago, say the New York Times, Washington Post, not Fox News, of course. But uh, and that didn't happen because the executives and the editors decided let's move left. It happened because the country in which they're, they're living has changed. The people who are the young journalists and opinion writers came out of the experience that we've just been talking about. It affected them. Now there are people banging at their doors just like they are at the other institutions. The JP Morgan Chase is worried about what they call uh, their reputational problems. They are to their internal memos talking about uh, disinvesting from fossil fuels because of reputational problems. That's the people out there who are going to say, we're not going to pay attention to you if you keep trying to destroy us. So the media and the, what you can do is provide the platform to which people will immediately turn first thing in the morning to say, here's the things that are important. Then I'll go to the media and read them with the proper perspective, know what they're leaving out, how they're shaping things and so on. I think that, and it, that change in attitudes in the popular culture will change the media, just like it's changing J.P. Work and Chase, not because Jamie Dimon had a religious conversion. Totally. And so, and, and I think one thing that I, I take from your book, um, Manufacturing Consent, is, is we're watching that in real time as well as you have companies that are out here saying Black Lives Matter and they're saying they're going to di divest from, from fossil fuels. But meanwhile, they're not doing any of that. They're just running really great marketing campaigns for the most part as a neoliberal conglomerate. You know, so how do we compare? How do we combat um, the manufacturing, the, the co-opting of people's energy and being sick and tired 
um, it's, sometimes it's really hard, hard to decipher. I, I don't know sometimes if it's, if I, if they're, if they're just trying to get me to, to pacify me or if, if I'm trying to, if, if, if we're actually moving in, a, in the right direction where we have, you know, this Biden um, Harris ticket, which is, you know, echo, you know, and for the environment an important for me, it's an important <laughs> ticket to get in so we can slow down the catastrophe that Trump's doing to our environment. But how do I know that when they're saying they're going to actually redistribute resources to the inner cities, how, how can I believe them if they've never done it before? You can believe them by keeping their feet to the fire. If you go home and say, okay, I'll leave it to you, it's not going to happen. If you continue with the activism that has led them this far, continue with it, they'll do it, just like they moved this far. That's the way it's always happened. Now, you don't put your faith in leaders. Uh, like if the uh, labor movement had stopped the organizing in the 30s, when Roosevelt started moving towards New Deal measures, they wouldn't have happened. You keep at it, it happens. That's the activism that got us this far, continuing, it'll go on. I mean, there is an establishment picture about functioning democracy. If you talk about a little manufacturing consent, quoting guys like Walter Lippmann and others, liberals, incidentally, Wilson, Roosevelt, Kennedy, liberals. Their picture is very clear and explicit. What matters is the president election. You focus like a laser on that, big extravaganza, get all excited about the convention speeches and all the hoopla and so on. And when that extravaganza is done, go home. As Lippmann put it, you are spectators, not participants. The responsible men, they're the ones who do it. You're ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. You're allowed to pick one of us every four years and then go home. That's the establishment picture. Actually, a lot of the left buys into that. Uh, all this business about lesser evil voting, it's got nothing to do with the left. You know, half the time you don't care, mostly you vote against. But, but that's the establishment picture. And they try to drive it into everybody's head. The left partially succumbs to it as well, as we've seen. That's not politics. In real politics, you're active and engaged all the time, whether it's uh, organizing local people to get a traffic light at an intersection, uh, uh, doing something at the school board to make sure teachers have decent classes, or whatever it is up to, that's activism. Keep at it, you change the society, just, just as in the past, just as in my lifetime, your lifetime. Uh, the, uh, but, it, but if you just say I'm a spectator, not a participant, yeah, I'll go back to where it was. So just be aware of it. So yes, they're trying to con you, obviously. Uh, they always are. So what you can do is say, thank you for the con, now continue and do something. So that leads me to a question um, that I think a lot about as a, as a secular um, Jewish person. Um, I look up to you, and I mentioned Howard Zinn, Karl Marx, as exemplars of Jewish thinkers who were speaking out for the oppressed people, for themselves and for others. Where is that movement right now? Like, where are, I'm, I'm sure you have a, a whole Rolodex of amazing, secular, radical Jewish thinkers that I don't know, but I, you know, I'm 35 and I, I'm seeking them out left and right. You know, Noam Chomsky, I don't have his phone number. This is a great honor to be talking to you, but where are the, the radical secular Jews like the Abraham Joshua Heschel's to, to be wa walking hand in hand with, with the people that are out on the streets right now, risking their lives about police brutality. Well, Heschel was an important figure but nowhere near as important as the kids who were riding freedom buses, including Jewish kids, some of whom got killed. They were way more important than Heschel. And they're around all over the place. 
uh, those are the people, since you mentioned my old friend Howard, he, one of my, one of his, the lines of his, that's my favorite, is something about how what matters is the countless unknown people who for, lays the basis for the events that show up in history. It's on their backs that the famous people show up. Uh, Martin Luther King, I'm sure, would have been the first to tell you that he was riding a wave which was created by snake workers in Alabama, uh, young black kids who refused to leave in a, uh, in a segregated lunch counter, you know, people like that. That's what created it. He was able to rise on that wave, do very important things. Hadn't been for them, you wouldn't have heard of Martin Luther King, you wouldn't have heard of Heschel. So that's what we should be looking for. And they're all over the place, like you, many others. Just take a look at any of the activist movements. So that's what matters. Plenty of them are known, some aren't, you know. Yeah, th thank you for that. Um, I don't know how, I, I don't have a time. I have no idea what, what we're, where are we at with time, Partha? Still have 10 you minutes. Still, you still have 10 minutes, no problem. Um, cool. Um, so Dr. Chomsky, I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the Federal Reserve. You know, I feel like it, it used to be before my time, it was something that we at least was in the conversation. And I, I don't feel like it's anywhere in our, our, our discourse sure. that they're pouring money into the economy right now. They're mostly benefiting the wealthy, but they're keeping the economy going. 2008, they saved it from being destroyed. Uh, you can question what they're doing, but they're very visible. I, I to totally agree with the fact that they set their interest rates. We get to see that. They make announcements. There's press conferences. But we don't talk about what happened on Jekyll Island when the Federal Reserve was created. We don't talk about how it's a semi-private, semi-public institution we don't talk about the fact that we don't get to know how many dollars are being printed until what what is it like five years six years later you know we don't have a, a clear depiction of what is being Actually, printed that is public information and if you guys look into it you can find it not everything you know but most of it is accessible to investigative journalism it's true that we don't talk about it but so that's i mean there are things there like uh, William Grider's book, for example, Secrets of the Temple, uh, Doug Henwood's book, and others. So it's there, and it's the job of activist intellectuals to make it public, bring it to the public, take it off the dusty library shelves and put things in front of people's eyes. And that's also true of ongoing activities. And people like Dean Baker, or Doug Henwood, uh, Paul Krugman sometimes, or putting out information, the Economic Policy Institute. They're doing things that could be brought to the public right away. So it, in your mind, as far as like an economic theory, how do you think we could move towards, you know, say nationalizing Amazon or doing something, you know, of that sort to, to, to actually push the needle, you know, create an infrastructure bill where we can put people to work. Like what are some of the concrete things that we could be thinking about doing right now or as a people? Well, I think uh, the thing to do is not so much nationalize as socialize, put them in the hands of their workforce and communities, not ruled by some bureaucrat in Washington. That can certainly be done. I mean, take, say, the fossil fuel industries. Right now, oil prices are pretty low. Even just buying for the government to buy the fossil fuel industries would not be a big dent at the federal budget. Okay, buy them, turn them. We can't get off it tomorrow. We're going to need fossil fuel to face reality. But they can be shifted towards... First of all, they can be put under the control of the workforce, the communities, the general population, which will make the decisions about what they do. They can be turned to 
working on renewable energy. They actually, most of the big companies, not Exxon Mobil, but most of them have renewable energy subsidiaries, which are actually profitable, but they sometimes put them out of business because they're not profitable enough. Like Chevron, which had a profitable renewable energy subsidiary, put it out of business because they can make, make more money poisoning the environment. Okay, that can be shifted if they're in public hands. Build the renewable energy part, phase out the fossil fuels, and do it fast. In fact, if you take a look at the Democratic Party program, you have to keep their fit, feet to the fire. You have to make them do it, like you said before, but that can be done. They're calling for accelerating the move to a net zero emissions uh, economy, which is important. So uh, socialize the fossil fuel industries, buy them off if you like, or just kick them out. Uh, devote, direct them to the things that we need, phasing out fossil fuels slowly, uh, offering jobs. People are going to lose their jobs. Okay, offer them better jobs in other areas. Plenty of possible jobs around in renewable energy, and construction, all over the place. Takes work, but that can be done. That's part of the Green New Deal. And uh, move towards making these industries contributing to the public welfare instead of destroying it. It, can, it could have. It can be done in many ways. Mm. In fact, uh, Obama's presidency, 2000, when the economy crashed in 2008, when Obama came in, he virtually nationalized the auto industry, basically took it over. There were choices then. One choice was to return it, fund it, return it to the former owners, maybe different faces and have them keep producing things that destroy our lives, like uh, traffic jams and highways and so on, uh, fossil you know, spewing out uh, CO2 and so on. That was one way. That was what was done. There was another way. And if there had been a popular culture backing it, that alternative way could have been taken. We've Now the government basically owns the industry, Turn it over to the workforce, turn it over to communities, kick out the bosses, kick out the banks, uh, devote it to producing what we need, which is not more cars on the clog up the highways, a decent mass transportation system. That's what people need. You're much better life if it doesn't take you three hours on the expressway trying to get to work every day. You just get there fast uh, reading a newspaper in a nice place. Can we kick out the banks without violence? Yes. How? They don't have the power. They, they rule by the basis of consent. This goes back to my favorite philosopher, David Hume, one of the first works on political theory. He opens it first paragraph by saying, uh, power is in the hands of the governed, those who are governed. The rulers rule only by consent. You take away the consent, goodbye. And of course, they've got plenty, plenty of force, but the force is people too. It's not abstract. You know, it's not coming from Mars. So infiltrate the force, take the power away from them. You can't do much, and they know it. That's why you have uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and others saying we've got to improve our reputations. When they hear the, to use the standard image, the peasants with the pitchforks, they get scared. They do. You can see it very clearly. You know, every January in Davos, Switzerland, fancy ski resort in Switzerland, all the great and powerful get together and call themselves the masters of the universe, and CEOs, and media chiefs, all those guys. Hollywood stars. World know. Economic Forum. Or, yeah. They, uh, and and it's, it's always self-congratulatory. Look how wonderful we are. Everything's going great and so on, especially since Trump. It was different this year. This year, the mood was we're in trouble. They're coming after us. Uh, we've got to do something. 
So the main theme was, we now recognize we've done wrong things. We've screwed you guys for 40 years. We're going to change. We're now going to be humanitarian, uh, ben benevolent. So put your trust in us. We're now good guys. You hear this over and over. Yeah. In the 1950s, it was, we're going to be soulful corporations. You know, just eyes lifted to heaven, all eager to serve you, but not to make money. We don't want that, all that stuff. Okay, we had that for 60 years. Now they're going to get again because they're scared. They're scared precisely because of what you raised. They don't have power. You have power. It can all collapse as soon as the population changes. It's possible. So how do we how do we keep that pressure? What what in in your imagination, if this goes the you know if the people take back power, what happens next? Next, they run the world. Not not like that again. You've got to think. It's not trivial. Uh, how do you take over? Suppose you take over the auto industry. How do we decide how to convert it to something like developing decent mass transportation? Okay. Uh, maybe having uh, could in fact be buses, you know, convenient buses that you don't have to wait 10 hours for and walk 10 miles for. If they're really around or, or small, uh, you know, there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, small, uh, you know, the, the, the conveyor cars, eight or nine people take people where they want to go. A lot of things are possible. But you have to work it out. And the people who know more than anywhere and else are the guys on the assembly line. They'll tell you how it can be done if they have the power to help make decisions. And you have to break through the failure to understand that you can make decisions. Any organizer knows whether you're working in the ghetto or anywhere else, the first thing you have to do is get people to understand that you can do something. I mean, the, we're taught, indoctrinated, that we're passive and helpless. Those big guys do everything. We can't do anything. How can you fight them? No, that's not true. You can do things, even if it starts small. And if you really have a chance, you can do a lot of things. Yeah. Okay, so I think the resources, the intellectual resources are there. They're not used. They're among working people, or people who actually do things. Uh, they can help figure out what we can do to implement these programs. Now, there are other, um, there are, you know, there are specialists in the intellectual class who have understanding and information. They can be brought in for advice, you know. Good advice, you take it, rotten advice, you know. <laughs> but uh, don't put power in their hands. That's got to be in the hands of the general public. And I think there are plenty of possibilities, and you see it being done. We see it all the time. That's why we're a better society than we were. Well, Dr. Chomsky, thank you so much for all that you've done throughout your lifetime. And uh, you've been a great exemplar for me. And uh, this has been a true honor. And I appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Good yeah. luck with the project. It's great yeah. Thank you. I, first of all, I want to thank you for what you have said um, in this half hour, um, talking to uh, my friend, Mordecai, and um, I'm going to ask you some questions uh, on behalf of my little online media, Humanity College. And um, I'm also doing something very similar that Mordecai is doing, is basically to create awareness and uh, talking to people about progressive politics and the fact that people are actually fighting back all over the world and, you know, like showing them the rays of hope, so to speak. Uh, yet, at the same time, uh, uh, picking up on what you just said about how people can come together and, and basically assume power, one of the things that um, as uh, an educator, lifelong educator, um, following your footsteps that I am experiencing myself is people's uh, lack of uh, reasoning, and not just lack of reasoning, but Mm, uh, complete lack of desire to learn something new that is not, you know, like uh, in the box 
And that has become like really a very formidable challenge. Uh, uh, for example, um, this year's uh, class, I've been teaching on two subjects only, and it's an online class. So basically I'm concentrating on two subjects. One is COVID-19 and the other one is uh, the police brutality and murder of George Floyd and the systemic racism. And um, uh, so on both fronts, there is a very strange uh, invisible resistance. The, the resistance about COVID-19 is that when I tell them that, look, in five months, in the richest country on earth here in the United States, we have lost 175,000 people. Uh, and uh, Cambodia and Vietnam did not lose anybody up until two weeks ago. And many other countries have really strongly taken measures to control the problem. The immediate response is that, well, these numbers are fake. So people who are suffering the most, even they are trying to wish it all away. So my question is, you, Noam Chomsky is there for us for such a long time and you have actually shaped our consciousness, so to speak. But at the same time, this decline of uh, intelligence, decline of reasoning power, isn't that in the way of bringing people together and seize power against these corporations and their money? First of all, they're not making it up. They hear it, they see it. Most of them probably watching Fox News or listening to Rush Limbaugh. That's what they hear. It's all fake. Never hear Rush Limbaugh. There are four corners of deceit, uh, science, uh, media, government, and academia. They live on deceit. Uh, there's tens of millions of people listen to them and hear that. They hear the president say it, and they hear the people around him say it. So they hear it's being drilled into their heads. Uh, and the results are pretty startling. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this story about how the uh, COVID-19 was created by Bill Gates and <laughs> Soros and a couple of others, Hillary Clinton, so they could put chips in you to control you. Turns out around 70% of Americans have heard that. And of Republicans, about two thirds believe it. Okay. Uh, it's not just here, incidentally. Uh, one of the things that happens on the internet and is gonna happen more and more, I'm sure, is people posting fake articles and attributing it to somebody that they want to discredit. Okay. It's very easy to do and there's nothing you can do about it. We're going to see a ton of it, even faked photographs and so on. Well, I've, it's happened to me when the pandemic broke, uh, things circulated on the internet about how the pandemic was created in a US government laboratory in order to control the world. Big story about that, signed by me, all over the place. I started getting letters from people in Europe friends, sensible people, educated people, saying thanks for finally telling the truth about the world. It's not just here. Um, this huge propaganda, not trying, it's not the kind that says believe in me, it says don't believe in anything. That ends up meaning believe in me. If you're in power and nobody believes anything, you're safe, okay? So it's not, I'm your savior. It's the whole world is just crap. Don't believe a thing. Everybody's fooling you. And I stay in power. Okay. That's the current form, the dominant form of propaganda. Trump's a master of it. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they play, there's a funny game going on in which he spouts out as many lies as he can think of. Uh, the uh, fact checkers in the media they go to work on it. They publish an article saying, oh, it's up to 20,000 lies. And Trump laughs and says, you know, let's make more of them tomorrow. Because everybody's going to forget about your fact checking if they ever looked at it. And the net effect is going to be who cares? Everything's a lie. Okay. It's 
perfect. That's a wonderful technique of uh, right. uh, creating dictatorship. Exactly. How do you deal with it? By exposing it. Exposing you don't it. check out, you don't check out, oh, he got to 20,000 lies and tears. Talk about what he's doing. What's the, talk to your students about what's the point of create, of circulating all of these and the effect of circulating all these lunatic stories. There's an effect. The effect is that people like you are not going to believe in anything. And you'll therefore leave power in the hands of a tiny group that's twisting you around their fingers. Right. That's what. Right. And then the, this is this is so important for people to understand. And I really thank you uh, for expressing that in you know the best possible way that we cannot even think of. Um, and 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 this is so true. If you look at the countries like the United States or Brazil. And India, these three countries come to my mind because, you know, I know about the United States and India very well. I have lived all my life in these two countries. Uh, and then I am seeing the numbers coming out of Brazil. Uh, and these are the three countries where basically a new authoritarian rule is in place. And, and the, the, the trend is so alarming because taking advantage of this crisis the media, social media, corporate media, everybody, you know, the right wing radio talk shows uh, like Rush Limbaugh and all that, they have created this strange uh, climate where de facto there is a single leader in these countries. In India, you have Modi, in the United States, you have Trump, and in Brazil, you have Bolsonaro. And, and basically, you know, like uh, as if there is no such thing as, as an opposition. I mean, here in the United States, it's probably a, just a little bit different. And right now the Democratic Convention is going on. So many people actually know that there is a Democratic Party in place. But in many other countries, taking advantage of this crisis, there is a huge, huge, you know, like uh, uh, artificially pumping up, you know, like a fascistic, semi-fascistic regime where people are not taking anybody else for their leader anymore. How do you fight that? Same way it's always been done. It's not new. Uh, I'm old enough to remember a much worse case, 1930s. Yeah. Go back to Germany and Italy, overwhelming support for the dear leader. I mean, Nobody has exact statistics, but you look at the scholarly literature, they figure probably over 90% of Germans were supporting Hitler until there started to be defeats, as long as they were triumphant. Maybe virtually everybody. This is the most, and just think of Germany for a minute. It's not a third world country. Yeah. In the 1920s, Germany was the absolute peak of Western civilization. Sciences, the arts, Weimar Germany was regarded as the model of democracy for the world. Political science is thought of as the best democracy in the world. Way on top in everything. 10 years later, it was the worst country in history. But that was one of the, one of the main- what it was before. These things can change. Yes, uh, but in Germany, uh, even though definitely it was at the peak of civilization at that time, and after World War I, there was a huge economic uh, downturn. And actually that, many say that that actually gave rise to, you know, the power of Nazis and, and fascists. And, and, and if, if Germany did not go through such a huge uh, catastrophic economic turmoil, then probably Hitler wouldn't have risen. I mean, that is, many people have that, uh, of course, that is moot right now, and we all know what happened. But it's not, it's not mechanical. The US went through the same crisis. What came out of it was the New Deal. Something like that could have happened in Germany. You took a look at the early 30s. There were basically three mass parties. One was the Nazis, which wasn't that strong. The 1928 election, they think they got 3% of the vote. 
uh, was before the depression hit. But the two huge parties were the Communist Party and the Socialist Party. Between the two of them, they way outnumbered the Nazis. If they'd gotten together, they would have won the elections. There would have been no Hitler. They were fighting each other. Okay, Communists were following the Stalinist line of uh, they're all social fascists. Brings back memories to me today when I listen to the Never Bidenites. They're all corporate liberals. Who cares? It's not going to do anything. You know, the, uh, that was the uh, they're all social fascist line in the 1920s. Social Democrats also had a similar position, not quite that extreme. If they'd been able to get together in the 1932 election, the last sort of legitimate one, they would have easily won. There wouldn't have been Nazis. These are, and in fact, the United States could have gone down that path. Could have. There were plenty of demagogues around. There was actually a attempted coup to get rid of Roosevelt was blocked by Smedley Butler, the Marines. Uh, if it hadn't been for labor organizing, CIO organizing, other activism, the United States could have gone in that direction. Well, we have, the point is we have choices. These things don't just happen. There always are choices. They are now, we're moving towards a it's not fascism, but it's kind of tin pot dictatorship. That's what we're moving towards now. Like some small country that has a, you know, overthrew the government every couple of years. And that's what we're moving toward. You know, take a look at the New York Times this morning. Uh, the peak establishment columnist, Thomas Friedman, you know, the voice of the establishment, says, will 2020 be the last American election? Is this the end of American democracy? I mean, when you hear the voices there, you know that things are in bad trouble. You've heard voices in more serious places long before he happened to notice, but now it's reached to that level. Yeah. And it's real. Yeah. I mean, it's well understood that we've got a unique figure in parliamentary history, first time, hundreds of years, of somebody who has no interest in the democratic process at all. He wants to end it. He wants to become the dictator. He'll do whatever he can to get it. Uh, the inspectors general, the executive are starting to look into your corruption firearm. Right? Uh, some one Republican dares to say, maybe you're not God. Go after her with a ton of bricks. They say, no, no defection. Everybody's got to be a psychophant. Worship me. Yeah. Uh, look to, and your adoring crowd stand in front of them, look to the sky and say, <laughs> I'm the chosen one. You know? Okay. That's uh, what we're faced with. It's clear that he will do absolutely anything yeah. to stay in power. Right. Could happen. Doesn't have to. That means it's going to be necessary to have an overwhelming vote, not just a defeat, overwhelming defeat to try to stop the shenanigans that they're planning, not just him, but the whole gang around him, William Barr and Pompeo and the rest of them. So, so you know, like that is really a, a scenario that we, you know, like uh, shudder to think um, but um, on one hand, you have that scenario where, you know, there is like uh, four more years of Trump and basically that is, you know, in all likelihood, that is the end of uh, a free democracy uh, as we have known it. And then that is something that we all have to work against and we have to vote him out of power. Uh, we have no problems with that. We all know that. But at the same time, the uh, people, who will be coming back to power, the, the, you know, the neoliberal Democratic Party, you know, what is there for us other than the fact that instead of dying tomorrow, we are going to die the day after tomorrow, if I can say it that Why? way. Why? I mean, the, when, if Biden gets elected, what, people who are involved in real politics will do 
is continue the activist pressure that has pushed the party program this far. Don't say, okay, we won, let's go home. No, you say, nothing's happened. We've got somebody in office who offers us a little space. Now I'll keep his feet to the fire, we'll use it. We'll force them to follow up on their programs and go beyond. Okay, how far beyond? As far as we can manage. No limit. I mean, take, it's very striking to look at the, even the coverage of the conventions. Now take a look at this morning's paper, okay? Both papers, main papers. They're all about the talks, things last night at the convention. They're very interesting. They very tell you a lot. So the Washington Post has more liberal. The two papers has a long article about the tone of the convention, how the moderates run out, went out, but the far left has a strong voice. Far left, that phrase is repeated over and over. Then it talks about what the far left is advocating. Two things. Universal health care, yeah. free higher education. Can you think of any other country that has universal health care? Can you think of one that doesn't? <laughs> Everybody has it. Everybody has it. That's the far left saying, let's try to rise to the level of the world. Uh, free higher education, in rich countries like Germany, Finland, France, poor countries like Mexico, it's all over. That's far left from the point of view of the liberal establishment. Right, right. Okay. And if you look at the times, it's not all that different, all kind of excitement of how wonderful it was to see the roll call with everybody yeah. standing up. And, and you and I have actually had, a, a, for me, it has been a wonderful privilege uh, to, you know, get this chance to talk to you for 20 years now. And, and I cannot thank you enough for that. But uh, you and I have talked about the politics, uh, you know, mainstream media, corporate media have played all these years, you know, starting from Judith Miller in New York Times and, and WMD uh, stories that, you know, like actually drove the country into a catastrophic war, destroying an ancient civilization and whatnot. And now you are basically, you know, saying things that have always resonated with me that on one hand, these progressive people, they are actually Bernie Sanders and, and you know, like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and, you know, that, that group of people, Pramila Jaipal, uh, whom I have known from my immigrant rights days and all that. They are trying to change the course of the discussion, but then they are actually being sidelined by New York Times and Washington Post and CNN. And, and people are not really getting to know their position because they are being branded as far left. I don't agree. The media are not saying what I would like, but they're saying things they never would have said 20 or 30 years ago. That is true. And what they were saying then sounds so outrageous, you can't believe it. I mean, uh, you know, you see the coverage of the Vietnam War. Take the far left of the mainstream, far left at the end of the war, 1975. Uh, 1975, the war ended, everybody had to make a comment. Way at the left end, you had Anthony Lewis of the New York Times. And what did he say? He said, the war began with blundering efforts to do good. <laughs> evidence? Who needs evidence? The United States did it. It was efforts to do good. You don't ask any questions blundering because it didn't work. He says, by 1969, it became clear that we could not bring democracy to South Vietnam yeah. at a cost acceptable to ourselves. So it was a mistake. I mean, it's kind of like somebody writing in the Communist Party press. <laughs> Meanwhile, the public had an opinion, which was not reported. Uh, there were careful studies of public opinion, Chicago Council of Foreign Relations, 75, 70 percent of the public at that time said the war was not a mistake. It was fundamentally wrong and immoral. And that lasted as long as they were taking polls. 
Nothing like that anywhere near the media. Yeah. Now you could say it. Not enough, but you could say it. You can't say uh, we're just uh, over, overflowing with uh, kindness and love and everything we do, the way it was said then by people like James Reston, the leading left columnist. No, you, you can't say that. Take a look at what you can say now. Take, say, the 1619 series in the Times, History of African Americans. Had its flaws, but it was a very strong report of 400 years of violence and repression and terror. Yeah. A couple of years ago, you couldn't have possibly had that. Okay, it's changing. It is Partly it's changing because a lot of the journalists have come out of the experiences of the 60s and 70s. They see the world differently. So you change the culture, you change the media. Yeah, Inter yeah, definitely. Uh, one th that that brings me to another question that I have asked you before, and I'm going to ask you one more time because I am a first generation immigrant from India, and I have gone through my own struggles of you know fighting against you know like explicit and subtle racism all these years, 35 years of our existence in this country. You know, first as a poor foreign student, and then as a permanent resident and then as an American citizen. So I have had my share of uh, racism and all that. And then I have seen, you know, the extreme brutality and systemic racism on our black brothers and sisters and George Floyd being the, one of the most recent examples. But at the same time, there is no uh, bridge building across the board, you know, blacks and immigrants and whites and even yeah. within the immigrant yeah. community, people do not yeah. turn to each other. That's not true. I just don't agree. Now take, say, the brutal murder of uh, Emmett Till. No reaction. Mm -hmm. Take George Floyd, nowhere near as bad as Emmett Till. Uh, huge demonstrations, black-white solidarity all over the place, more public support than any social movement has ever received in the United States, two-thirds. Yeah, with black-white solidarity. It's not Emmett Till. Okay. Oh, definitely. Black-white solidarity, I see that all the time, but I'm, I'm actually talking about, in particular, the solidarity between the two poorest sections of the society, the blacks and the newer immigrants, you know, Latinos and Indians and, and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. And, you know, there is such a huge, uh, like, invisible wall between the two poorest and most vulnerable sections of the society. wall wasn't in the streets. The wall was blacks and whites marching together. Okay. And it wasn't just for a one day demonstration on the National Mall in Washington. It was months. And it's also working on real issues together. Okay. Not perfect, you know, but a big change. Uh, so that's what you're after. Change. Make things better. Sometimes things get worse much worse, like India. Uh, India is going through one of the worst moments in its history. Right. With, uh, you know, a, a racist, uh, ultra-religious lunatic uh, with, who's got about 70% support. That's scary. That's kind of like Germany in the 30s and the 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, but that can end too, has before. Thank you. One final question, if I may ask you, how do you see if I may ask you, how do you see a world post Chomsky? Same as it is now. Other people will be raving, ranting, just like I am, just as they are already. Mm -hmm. I, I, can, like I can ask you that question because I have known you for such a long time and I consider you to be my friend, philosopher and guide. So forgive me if I have asked it in an inappropriate way. But... Um, I, I cannot really express uh, my gratitude enough uh, for what you have taught me all these years. And you have really been uh, uh, a living inspiration for me. And I really want to thank you enormously for that. But the people we should be looking at with inspiration are the people in the streets. They're the ones who are really doing things. It's always been like that. You want to look at the civil rights movement. Everybody thinks of Martin Luther King, 
not enough of us think of the SNCC workers riding freedom buses in Alabama, risking and sometimes losing their lives to try to get intimidated black voters to vote. They're the ones we should be honoring. And that's true everywhere. That's, uh, so they're the people who matter for tomorrow. We can respect them. We can use their work and sacrifices to get an audience for their benefit and respecting them. They're the leaders. Professor Chomsky, we got two minutes and I'm sure you've been asked this question before. Um, Dr. West always talks about the difference between being a short term or, or a, a long distance runner and a sprinter. You've been a long distance runner in your career. How have you, you know, kept the march going? Like, what did you do to fortify yourself and sustain yourself to be able to be a freedom fighter, you know, from when being the first vocal voice coming out against Vietnam to all the way to today, um, still being out here doing calls with people that you don't even know? Like, what, what, what keeps you going, sir? People like you, people who are picking it up, carrying it forward, as long as they're around. Nothing, you don't need any more motivation. Or looking at the people in the streets, or the kids in the Sunrise Movement who managed to get the uh, Green New Deal on the legislative agenda. Or take a look at, uh, I've seen it all over the world. I've been in many parts of the world with real intense poverty and terror, way beyond anything we're experiencing. So it's a very poor village in southern Colombia, miles from the highway, you can barely get to it by the road where when you get to the village, you pass a, a little uh, place where there's white crosses where people were murdered by paramilitary. You finally get to the village, you see engaged, active people, very poor, very little formal education, working on the means to try to save their the mountain near them, their hydrological resources from a gold company that wants to destroy it, gold mining company. You see people like that, you don't need any more inspiration. And it's all over. I just, uh, I just wanted to thank you one more time on behalf of uh, uh, Humanity College. And uh, if you have um, any final message for the younger people who are coming together, uh, writing in a new way, reporting in a new way, doing citizen journalism on the street, uh, that would be really wonderful. I would much appreciate any message for them. Message for them is to look at the world around you, at the vast problems that exist, at the suffering, the repression, the threats to survival, and pick up your pen. These days it's your computer. Start letting people know about it. Investigate it. Bring it to others in any way you can. That's your job as journalists, as intellectuals, as organizers, as activists. Thank you very, very much. Amen. It was a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Sorry, I got to get off, but I got the next one coming. <laughs> See you later. OK, thank you. All right, wow. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's simply wonderful. That was really amazing. Thanks for uh, making that happen, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anytime. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back to him some other time down the road. Yeah, let's figure out, um, you know, before we share anything, just like figure out how we're going to do it. I, I think I'm going to, you know, write my piece into a q and A. I'm not sure how I'll use video, but I might use some video. How are, what were you thinking for your 